like to welcome everybody to this service, remembering my mother and father, James Gordon Weiser and Evelyn Blair Weiser. We've got people listening on Zoom and like to welcome them and mention to anyone who doesn't have the program or if you're on Zoom, you can go to the White Pines uh, Funeral Mortuary in Logan and there you'll find a link under my mom's or dad's obituary to the program. And so you can see that. Um, I also wanted to recognize my mom's bestest best friend, Susan. Um, Susan Allen, she, they called and talked to each other on the phone every day and she was unable to come here to talk today. But she loves my mom and she's listening. Also, um, I just like to mention that my brother, who is the patriarch of our family now, Ron James Weiser, I mean Ron Gordon Weiser, <laughs> Um, is he's in the audience. Um, we will we'll start by seeing him each life that touches ours for good, him 293, and after that we'll follow the program as it is written. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful to be here today to honor and cherish our memories of Gordon and Evelou. We're grateful for their lives, for their 
kindness and good humor and the wonderful parents and grandparents that they were and especially the the wonderful husband and wife that they were such a great example of of a beautiful marriage and love and enduring respect and companionship that they provided to us all. We pray that thou would bless all of our family with thy spirit of comfort and hope at this time, especially Ron, Bob, and Shelley. We're grateful for the gospel and especially for our Savior and our knowledge that because of him, we will see each other again in the flesh. And we say these things in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. My grandpa was born December 10th, 1927, in Lewiston, Utah. He was the fourth of nine children. He was delivered by my grandma's grandfather, Dr. William Brigham Parkinson, who was assisted by his grandmother, Letty Stocks. He was a child during the Depression and grew up on the family farm in Lewiston. In 1939, when grandpa was 11, his Aunt Effie wrote the following. Gordon likes geography, the best of school subjects, and arithmetic next. He likes to make airplanes. He is a good kid, works very hard, and is dependable and always good-natured and agreeable, and does his work well, and he is an unusually good worker for his age. He works in the field all day, trimming and hoeing beets and onions and getting them ready for market. He has milked the cows and done chores since he was a small boy of five and six years old. Grandpa was a hard worker his whole life. He would always help others in need, even when he wasn't asked. He was never put out. He never complained about anyone or anything. While in his youth, Grandpa had several medical issues. He had his tonsils and appendix removed and had a mastoid inner ear gland infection in operation in December of 1934. He stayed in the Budge Clinic for 10 days and missed much of the school years. As a result, he was one of one to two years older than most of his classmates. However, for the rest of his life, he had remarkable health. He might have spent one day in the hospital after that. He was a member of 4-H Club in 1939 called the Cub River Tiny Beef Club. 20 members received calves from Bear Lake, raised them, and took them to market at a stock show in Salt Lake City. He did it again the next year. He also helped with tractor implement business of his father until his parents and younger siblings moved to a larger farm in Euphrata, Washington in 1951 as part of the Columbia Basin Project. As a result of the tractor business and being raised on a farm, Grandpa could fix anything. He graduated from North Cash High School in 1947. He was a talented runner in high school and in 1946 set a new mile record of 4 minutes 53 seconds, shattering the old record by 19 seconds. <coughs> He served as a missionary in the Northwestern States and West Central States missions from 1950 to 1952. He was inducted into the Army in 1952 after joining the National Guard in 1948. He served for two years between World War II and the Korean War with the Motor Pool in California, Arizona, Virginia, and the Aleutian Islands. He was an instrumental part of assisting the building of an airplane runway on the Aleutian Islands. On February 17, 1955, he married Evelyn Blair in the Logan LDS Temple. Even though there had been some limited contact before, Grandma and Grandpa liked to tell the story of their real first meeting. Grandma had been dropped off by the bus east of Lewiston. Her parents were not there to pick her up. Grandpa and his brother, Silmer, were on their way home, stopped and offered to drive her the few miles into town. They, assu they assured her they were part of the Weiser family from Lewiston, and she reluctantly agreed. That began a relationship that lasted almost 70 years and will continue eternally. He received a Bachelor of Science degree in Industrial Technology from Utah State University in 1957. 
One of his most difficult jobs was being a driving trainer instructor at Utah State when Grandma was one of his students. Even though Grandma could drive, and she did quite a bit when they were lived in Huntsville in Seattle, she was never comfortable with driving, especially on freeways. For the rest of their lives, until Grandpa was in his early 90s, she always let Grandpa do the driving. Gordon was an aeronautical engineer and was part of the space program during the 1960s. As a result, he worked for several aerospace companies, including Lockheed and Boeing aircraft companies, and in partnership with NASA at times in various states, including California, Washington, Alabama, and Texas. His work included the Saturn V Boeing Dinosaur and 747 aircraft projects. The family lived in so many places while the kids were growing up that one April Fool's Day in Texas, they announced they were moving again and bought boxes for the kids to pack. After about half an hour of that nonsense, they came in to say April Fool's. <laughs> in 1971, he returned to Utah and graduated with a master's degree from Utah State in Industrial Technology. He then worked with several companies in northern Utah, including Vehicle, but primarily for Ezra and Cordell Lundell, who had contracts with John Deere Company designing farm machinery and equipment. Gordon was a master designer and inventor. He held several patents for farm equipment, including a large hay, hay baling combine. What he enjoyed most was designing, building and testing the equipment from start to finish. He would fly off into Idaho to test the equipment, and though he never completed his pilot's license, he had worked toward that goal off and on during his professional career. Grandpa was an active member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints throughout his life and served in callings as a disciple of Christ. He loved to attend church meetings and fulfill his calling as a home teacher. He was also the clerk of choice for many leaders because of his meticulous record keeping. You could see him on the stand taking minutes at most meetings. In later life, Gordon and Evelou were service missionaries in Logan, Utah at Deseret Industries. He did an assignment given to him there, and one time, he was cleaning the parking lot when an associate passed on the highway and asked, why do they have an aeronautical engineer working in the parking lot? It didn't bother Grandpa. He knew he was doing the Lord's work. Grandpa and Grandma spent most of their retirement in, Cobble, in Cobblestone Subdivision in Providence, Utah, and enjoyed their time with their friends there. Gordon was very good at strategic games, including cards, chess, and playing ping pong. He taught his children to play chess and ping pong at an early age. He would never let them win. They were thrilled as teenagers when they finally could beat him at times. Though he never was officially titled a chess master, he defeated many who were so titled. He had a great love for knowledge. He had a monthly subscription to popular science and mechanics and would read them from cover to cover. He took an astronomy class, not because it was required, but because the universe was of great interest to him. Grandpa was the kindest, most gentle man. He never said a crossword to Grandma that we know of. When you visited, he would be holding her hand, even though he had severe dementia and didn't really know anybody. At the end of the life, he would still ask for his beloved Lou. He would do anything for Grandma. My grandfather, age 96, passed away peacefully on November 11, 2024, at the Legacy House Park Lane in Farmington, Utah. Thanks to you all who helped Grandpa and Grandma during their last few difficult years. He would have been 97 on December 10, 2024. He had a full, rich, and long life. Grandpa and Grandma were blessed with three children, my father, Ron, Uncle Bob, and Aunt Shelley, who survived them. Also seven grandchildren and their spouses and 19 great-grandchildren. He's also survived by two sisters-in-law and one brother-in-law and many other family and friends. He was predeceased by his parents and eight brothers and sisters and their spouses. I will miss Grandma and Grandpa. They were true examples of how to live a good and blessed life. Evelyn Blair Weiser, she was born September 30th, 1935, lived till November, and passed away peacefully on November 20th, 2024, at Legacy House Park, Park Lane in Farmington. She was born, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, she was the oldest of three children, born to Harold w William and Beth Blair. Her grandmother, Evans Beth Parkinson, and her motherly aunt, Mammy, uh, Kronk played an important role in raising her. She graduated from North Cache High School in 1953 
and attended Utah State University. She was known for her poetic readings she frequently gave while in high school. In 1950, she gave a memorable reading at a missionary farewell of a young man in her ward who, unbeknownst to either of them, would become her future husband. On February 17, 1955, she married James Gordon Weiser in the Logan LDS Temple. They were married for 69 years. They were blessed with three children, Ron, Bob, and Shelley. She loved being a mother and a teacher to her children. While making her home a wondrous and engaging place, Gordon was an engineer, so they lived in California, Washington, Alabama, Texas, while raising their children. In 1971, Gordon and Evalu returned to Utah, and Evalu graduated with a degree in elementary education from Utah State. She taught first and third grade for more than 30 years in the Cache County School District. She was a beloved teacher of her students, who, uh, who, who often would come up to her as adults in Cache Valley and thank her for what she taught them. Evelyn was an active member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints throughout her life and a lifelong disciple of Christ. She served diligently in many callings in the Relief Society, Primary, Young Women's Organizations. In later life, Gordon and Evelyn were service missionaries in, the Logan, um, in Logan at Desert Industries. Evelu was part of the literacy and ESL programs. Gordon and Evelu spent much of their time retirement in Cobblestone Subdivision in Providence, and Evelu enjoyed her friends and book clubs there. She was a talented artist and an excellent seamstress. There were times in her younger life when she, would, she made clothes for her and her children. She could make extraordinary jewelry and had an eye for drawing and seeing beauty in the world. She lit, when, when they lived in St. George, she was a museum docent in the library system. She was much registered, uh, uh, requested, sorry. She was much requested storyteller for children. She loved to shop and could be seen at Chico's even into her late 80s. Evelyn loved her dogs, Cece, Mimi, Kiki, Zizi, and Buddy. Oh no, I lost my Okay. Evelyn is survived by her children, Ron, uh, who's married to Cindy, Bob, who's married to Bev, Shelly, and a dear friend and family, Kathy. Seven grandchildren, Trina, who's married to Matt, Robert, who's married to Tiasha, Tisha, who's married to Ryan, J2, who's married to Sarah, me, Dave, who's married to Christy, Logan, who's married to Michaela, Andrew, who's made it, married to Kaylee, Kylie, sorry, and 19 great grandchildren. Uh, she is also survived by her younger sister, uh, Susan, one sister in law, Bev, who is married to Denny Weiser, and who was married to Denny Weiser, and many other family and friends. She was predeceased by her parents, infant brother, and beloved husband, Gordon, who passed away November 11th, 2024 and other much-loved family members and friends. We express our appreciation to all those who have helped Evolu in any way during the last few years of her life, especially the staff at Legacy House and for their caring kindness and all those from Susie's Senior Companionship Services, especially Brandy who attended her during her dialysis sessions. Late, um, late in U.S. renal care, um, Aspire Hospice and Davis County Senior Medical Ride Staff. I'd like to finish with a, a great memory I have of Grandma. We often uh, go to her house for Thanksgiving and she always made really delicious food. And uh, not only that, she would take the time to put it in nice glassware and have us set out fancy dishes and, and she always spent time to make our beds that we were going to sleep in. She always was making sure we felt comfortable and enjoyed our stay with her. She, she always kept things so nice for us and, and loved uh, spending time with us and loves, and we love spending time with her. And I'm pretty sure she had a bag of cookies in the freezer and I'm pretty sure she kept them there just for me. 
every time I went. I don't think I ever didn't have a cookie when I went to her house. I'm so happy for these great memories for both of them, and I look forward to for their, the rest of their the rest of eternity. And in the name of Jesus Christ, Amen.
before I start, let me just mention that my brother Ron added his thoughts to those, the biography sketches, so you heard us talk. He's not going to give a talk today. If I could somehow summarize my mom and dad, I would think I would say loving mother and loving father. Um, they live their lives that way. And we love them, and I think it's passed down through generations. They reminded me of who I really am. And when I was around them, I felt a special spirit. It just, it emanated from them. And I think I'll miss that the most. When I went around with my mom, shopping and doing other things, eating sometimes, we, um, the story you heard that she would, we'd run into people. There was all the time these people would come up that were old or had kids or, and they would just be talking to my mom and smiling and they were all excited and it was like, and then I'd find out that they were her kindergarten student or first grade student, but that they impacted her life so much they just had to talk to her about what she had instilled in their lives. And she was always like that. She was, she, if I could say another thing about her, it's she knew how to teach. I remember when I was in primary, I heard my mom was gonna start teaching my class and I was like 10 or nine or 10. And I was like embarrassed. I thought, oh no, this is gonna be really bad. And uh, she got in there and I was like blown away. She like, it was so good. I, I just wanted her teaching my primary classes from then on. She, she knew how to, and you might have heard about her, uh, that poet background she had. She could also bring the stories to life of like Christ and all the other stories. And she liked to make sure she changed her tones when she spoke and the, for different characters. And you could kind of almost feel the different people in her stories. Um, so she did that for primary and her school and for us as kids. Um, along with the primary class, she one time I remember stickers we had that they, they were in these ring binders and it was on Christ and we'd do these stickers of paintings each week of Christ's life. And I just remembered thinking, oh, that that's so neat. I wish there were more paintings of Christ's life. and. She liked art stuff too, and so stuff like that, she made sure to include in her classes, and she'd bring us to her classroom to help decorate her classrooms for the elementary kids, and then she wanted them to have an experience of a lifetime. She, we even helped her with handouts, and that's why you'll see on the back of the program, you'll see something that's kind of a little unusual. It's got this things my mom and dad taught me, so I wanted to give you a handout in remembrance of my mom. Uh, and so I'm not going to read through all those things that that my mom taught me, but I'll just I'd let me just read a couple. Um, there's more way, more than one way to do something, and how to improve on things that can't be changed. Don't make your mom sad, or you will have to you will have to answer to dad. <laughs> that was a good one when I was young. Don't make up excuses. I'll let you read through them. Um, that really covers a lot of the things she taught us. I was trying not to use my glasses, but I guess I'm going to have to. Oh, she'd also have us memorize every church talk we did. Um, fortunately, I don't have to memorize this. I could talk forever about my mom and dad. But she would have us memorize them. And it's because she felt like if you memorized them, you could touch the people better than just reading through the, the talks. And she believed in that teach one another concept. She would buy self-improvement books and I think it was to help herself, but she would leave them laying all over around the house. So I ended up reading them and I, I think my brother and sister did too. Um, they were, all kinds of help. She even did it after we were married, and some I thought were especially for me. She had laid around, it was funny. Um, what else? We've got, I 
her love of learning, I think that was the way of, she also served the Lord, you know, um, by teaching people. And when you're in the service of your God, you know, well, when you're in the service of your fellow man, you're in the service of God. And so that was her, her big way of giving back. So anyway, we were, my dad was doing the Saturn V and that's going to the moon, the first rocket that went to the moon. And he was a lead engineer. And, but anyway, everyone, they had the control station in Houston, even though the rockets took off in Florida. It's because of political things. But anyway, in Houston, all these engineers moved into there. And I was young at that time. I was somewhere around nine, eight, nine, I don't know. Anyway, so they all moved there at the same time. There was no houses to get. So we stayed in the Ramada Inn for two months. And it was great on the part of swimming. Like we got to swim every day for two months. The reason that I tell them this story though is we would come back to the hotel room and my mom would have these special things. She, you know, papers that she had colored and games and educational games and to keep us entertained. And, and it was amazing. And the other kids in the hotel that were like us, where their parents were engineers, would start to attend or come to my mom's little games and they were just like blown away and that was one of the first i mean one of the first times in my life that i was realizing how special my mom was in that in that way of her teaching and and making things out of nothing you know that made it fun She would also lay around the house and have Vogue magazines because she was into fashion. And so we always had a stack of fashion magazines around. Um, the funny thing is she, the shirt she made for us, for Ron and Shelly and I, I'd go to school, sometimes I'd almost be embarrassed. She'd make this weird design thing and I'd go and all the girls at school would be like, oh, that's so cool. You know, where'd you get that shirt from? So then I decided she knew what she, was doing when it came to fashion. Uh, that was kind of fun. And so a lot of you remember her and how she dressed so well. And you might see that video coming in the today of her. We were just going to tape her. We were doing some tapes that she dressed all up and had her dog with her. And anyway, so that that's fun. She always encouraged us with whatever we did. Just tell one last quick story on her. We had one time we were um, I don't know how it started. I think we had extra balloons at home or something. And this, someone started splashing somebody and we were filling up water balloons and it, this was happening in the house, a big water fight. Yeah, and my mom was clean when I came to the house. And the water fight got bigger and bigger. Pretty soon the hose was being brought to the house, you know, with the water. And then my mom says, whoa, whoa, whoa. So we had to hurry and put it away. And it was really a fun experience. It was really funny. and. The thing, the main thing was she said, we have to have this clean in an hour before daddy gets home. We can't know that we sprayed the whole house to anyway, it was fun. Um, going on to my dad for a little here. He, he really believed in, in God and, and going to church and what he could learn from church and being better, a better person. And he, he would bring up religious ideas once in a while. And I'm gonna just read this one so I get it right, cause I'm up here. So he's like, Ron and I were sitting at the table and he's like, uh, he says, this idea that the universe exploded from nothing is ridiculous. You can't create something from nothing. There's always been something before and something before that forever. And that was a hard concept as a teenager to grasp that there's always been something, but then it made sense after a while, realizing you can't really, why would something come from nothing? And so things have been around forever, but anyway, he, he really believed in following Christ. Um, in Acts 10, 38, let me just read this. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good 
and hearing all that were oppressed of the and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. The reason I'm reading that scripture is that going around doing good, when he passed away, my mom, the first thing she said, well, she cried and mourned a little bit. The first thing when she had come, basically calmed down, is she said that he was such a good man. He was such a good husband. And then she would forget that because like every 15 minutes she would forget short-term memory. And so, and she'd say to me again, she'd turn to me again. That's why I felt like I had to tell you this. He was a good man. He was a good husband. And she did that over and over again. My dad did do a ton of things for my mom. She didn't think she could live without him. He liked to do anything that he could. And they treated her like a queen. And they loved each other. I think that's why they lived so long because they kind of helped each other. Um, he also, there was an experience that my Bev went back, my wife, Beverly, she went back to school when she's older and at Utah State and she drove up there to go there and about a couple nights a week she would stay overnight because it was too far to keep driving back to where we lived and she on the days where it snowed and there was ice on the car, he went out and cleaned her window and the snow off every morning and he made her breakfast. And she will always remember that, how he cared for other people. Okay, I'll talk a little about the chess. And um, so he taught me how to play chess and Robert and or, and <laughs> he taught Ron and Shelly too. So basically he would, but I'm gonna mention some of, the, some of the statements he made that were kind of funny. Um, I'd be ready to make my first move and he would say, he would say, let me see where it is. Go ahead and make your first mistake. It was my first, <laughs> yeah, it was my first move, you know? And uh, he would say things like, it was a boring game, you know? <laughs> And he was, that was a fatal mistake in your yet. And then also that was your last mistake. Um, oh, one other thing he did say is he's, he would say that was a wasted move. And that kind of actually, that impacted my life wondering when I did other things in life, was that a wasted move? Was that, a, you know, so that was kind of fun. Shelly's gonna talk about his ping pong. Um, my dad did have a natural aptitude for sport, sports. I think that's because he was a farmer. He was really into like technology and would talk to me about it all the time. He got popular mechanics um, his whole life. I mean, I figure if they found someone with the longest a subscription in the US, it would have been him. And he would talk to me about things. Bev once brought home these oil fields, some technology, and because he had read it there, he started talking to her about the technology. And anyway, he was one of the first ones to buy an electric car, because that was new when it came out, and he was, he really liked that. This part's kind of interesting, some of you may not know, is during the 1920s to the 1940s, let me read this so I don't mess up on it. Um, this period is often referred to as the golden age of tractors, as it was during this time that some of the most iconic and influential machines were developed. I mean, back then they were used as horses still. And they suddenly come out with all these tractors. And at that time, my grandpa owned a, the, he owned the, basically where the farmer equipment shop in Lewiston and sold all this equipment and would even trade it for horses. And um, so my dad and his brothers would go out, they'd get these boxes, and they would go out, put the machinery together on these people's farms and uh, get it running. And my dad said about this, because these were such new, innovative stuff. And let me just read it, because I have to keep writing it down to make sure I get it right. He said, we put together stuff no one had ever seen before and take it out. And that was so neat to him. 
And now we get technology coming so fast, we don't notice that. But back then, you know, there were still horses and people didn't have cars. Some of them didn't have cars. He, um, oh, he said one time, Grandpa, said, a farmer came over to complain that his kids, which included my dad, were out there putting together the machinery. And my dad and my grandpa said, well, did it run? Does it run? And the farmer would say, yeah. And he says, and my grandpa would say, well, there you go. And that's all my grandpa would say. Anyway, so my dad and them, they were, got, they were really good at doing stuff like that. Um, so he learned how to do that stuff when he was young. I just have two quick stories. And I, this one was we were, um, in Washington State, we were driving around Susquehanna, and we were driving up this dirt log road, and it kept getting smaller and smaller, and it was scary. There was cliff on the one side; it wasn't quite sheer, but on the other side, I'd look out my window, and it just went down. I thought, "Is the wheel even on the road?" You know, and um, I was around, I don't know, maybe eleven, twelve, and so you can kind of range my brother and sister, and then. I remember my mom saying, I'm so scared, I can't keep going, the road's getting smaller, and she would be scared in the car sometimes. And he, would, he was like, well, we're okay. And then he says, well, I'll just turn around if you want. And I was like, what? Because, you know, I'm old enough by then, I know my dad, if he says that, he's gonna do that. So I was thinking there, do I wanna die rolling down the cliff, you know, falling off? And so he turns to stop, He's turning to stop against the edge, which is not even a full turn. Like he bear, and I'm, I got my hand on the door and I said, I'm leaving this car. I'm not staying. And, and so, and I was thinking, I'll, I'll just take Shelly with me. She was sitting right next to me in the middle. And so he stops the car. I whip the door open without asking, you know, this is, I whip it open, grab her, and we go out. And I look, and Ron's already out. Mom's out of the car. <laughs> Nobody had talked. It was just like, everybody, everybody was just out. And my dad later, when I, we were talking about it later, he says, yeah, that was the weirdest experience. He says, I look, and my wife's gone. And I look in the mirror, and my, I hear a noise, he says. And my kids are all out of the car. Was, he didn't make the turn safely, but it was, anyway, that was, he kind of tended to do what he said he was going to do. And um, one other saying I'd just like to say, he kind of, oh, no, I have to tell this story. I'm sorry. I hope I. So I go into the restaurant. I mean, I'm working at a restaurant when I'm a teen. A, journal. a guy calls me over and he says, are you, are you Gordon Weiser's son? And I go, yeah. And he goes, I want you to know, um, I lent him a rototiller once and I remembered it myself because Ron and I had helped do the yard with it. And he says, that rototiller hardly worked. Even when I bought it, it hardly worked. But when it came back to me, that rototiller worked like new. I would lend anything to your dad that he wanted to borrow. So anyway, I thought that would be a good thing to end on with, besides one of his sayings that he would say all the time is, I have this rope of freedom. And as you kids get older, I let the rope out. And pretty soon I let go of it. As you learn more and more and make better choices, I know they're happy now. They're, um, I do know that, just so you know. I know they're really happy where they're at now. Even though they had a couple few years where it's really been difficult, that they're happy, that they're smiling down on all of us. And I'd like to say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. I told uh, Kathy I was doing good till they closed the casket, so I'm sorry, guys, if I <sighs> don't do as good. The world talks about great love stories like Romeo and Juliet and Mark Anthony and Cleopatra and all those ended in tragedy. <laughs> but to me, the greatest love story was Gordon and Lou, that pretty much everything they did together, and they were a great team, as kids, we couldn't ask mom for something and be told no and then go ask dad and try to get a yes. They were on the same page with us as kids. And mother hated it when dad had to work, uh, travel for work and, and always wanted him by home and very sad. And I ran into, I don't know if they're still here, the McAllisters that they used to 
go to Europe with, and they told me the one trip mom went without dad, she was so missing him by the end of the trip, it wasn't even funny. So I'm so glad that um, we could let them go together. And I only remember maybe disagreements and discussions, but they never, ever argued, ever. I don't ever remember an argument from them, which is rare these days to ever have a married couple not have arguments. Um, and then the, and the interesting thing that we got a lot of comments from the caregivers at Legacy that how much in their last few years they still loved each other. Dad was always concerned. When mom went to dialysis, he's always like, where's Lou? Where's Lou? And they always sat and held hands at dinner and stuff. And that just tells you of their love for each other. And that they were such great parents. I always thought that everybody had such a great family life and great parents, you know, and as you get older and talk to other people, and there's some sad stories out there. And I realized how lucky the three of us were to have them as parents. And um, like Bob mentioned, we always moved a lot. And so I never really had a lot of friends. We always met people and had friends in the area, but I never had any best friends for my brothers and my parents until now we met Kathy, that I finally have a best friend. So I still think of them as the greatest love story ever. So let me talk about dad. Bob mentioned this, that mom, dad was such a good man, just plain old good. And uh, the same thing was she, he was talking about how good he was. She turned and said, Shelly, maybe that's why you never got married, because you could never find somebody as good as your dad. And I think to an extent that is, is very true that nobody could ever measure up to dad. Um, the thing about dad, he was the most non-judgmental man I knew. Um, I'll tell one story when he was back in the army, so that would have been 52 to 54, he was on one of the base camps, I mean one of the camps, and as you guys all know, racism was, racism was still awful in the 1950s, and you still had a segregated army. And dad was out wandering one night, and he, he walked by a rec hall, and he could hear ping pong going on in the rec hall. So he thought, well, I'm gonna go in and play ping pong. People are playing ping pong. So he walked in the door, and the whole uh, rec center was, it was the black part of camp. But they welcomed him with open arms, because he said, I'd like to play ping pong, and they just said, come on in. And he played ping pong, and he beat, they were playing the winner stays and the next one comes, and he beat everybody, but there was one guy sitting over the bar just kind of casually reading a book. And so he had beaten everybody, and they said, why don't you come, come over? And he goes, okay, I guess I will. He brings his book over, he's still reading, and plays ping pong with dad with his book. And I think dad said that was the only time he ever got slaughtered in ping pong. <laughs> But uh, he, he laughed and uh, they said, come back anytime, we'd love to have you come ping pong, play ping pong. But unfortunately, his commander heard about it and he was told he couldn't go to that side of the camp anymore. But um, so in our house, ping pong tournaments were epic. We always had a ping pong table growing up either in the basement or in the garage or somewhere, we always had a ping pong. And we would always play, always play tournaments. And uh, I remember mom would always say, oh, I'm not gonna play, you guys go ahead. But it wasn't until he was in his 70s that I finally beat him. That's how good he was his whole life with ping pong. And Bob told me that I guess Robert was going to play him about um, 10, 15 years ago when he was in his 80s. And Robert's 
all cocky because he's the young kid. And Bob went up to him and said, Robert, you need to be careful. Dad is a really good ping pong player. Did he win still, Robert? Yeah. <laughs> So that was one of the great things about dad that I always remember was a ping pong. And I still love to play a good game of ping pong. The second thing I remember about dad was how kind of goes with his non-judgmental about people. He was also um, not chauvin chauvinistic at all. I can't pronounce today, I apologize. But he always told me being a, a woman, in the 60s and 70s growing up, he told me I could do anything I wanted. That I could be anything, I choose any job that I thought I could do. And it wasn't until I got to work that I realized there are people out there who do not think that you can do a job because you're a woman. And I didn't know what to do because I'd grown up in, the, in a household where I was never taught that. There was a couple stories he used to talk. Oh, well, let me add this other one. And so dad was a fixer and we never, I don't ever remember a repairman coming to our house for anything, dad would fix it. But because of that, he taught, um, I was his assistant for years. And because of that, I know how to um, do construction work. <laughs> and all those kind of things, because dad taught me. Him and I, because um, the boys had gone already, him and I um, built, uh, we modeled a whole, or put a whole basement together, just him and I. And he tried to teach me things around the house and how to do things. And for years, I used to change my own, my own oil in cars, um, obviously until it became hazardous waste materials. So, but he taught me all this stuff and he didn't care that I was a girl. <laughs> and uh, one other story about him in the workplace that he told, and I hope I get this right, but he, it was when he was at Boeing, I think it was when he was at Boeing, they had this woman engineer, which was not a common sight in the 60s, and the, the um, manager, purposely assigned her to design the waste tube for the jet pilots. And dad was really upset. He said, not that she couldn't do the job, but he was doing it to embarrass her. And so he actually went into the boss and said, don't play those games. Just because she's a women, woman, you don't need to make her embarrassed and feel bad about that. So that's the kind of man he was. And as everybody mentioned, he was a hard worker. When Kathy and I were fixing some, ha some houses, and I'd just keep going and going and going, and she's like, are you not gonna ever sit down? <laughs> and I said, my dad taught me, you'd go until the job gets done, and then you get to sit down. It was like that row of beets. You had to get it completely cleaned and weeded before you got that drink of water at the end. Um, one other last thing about my dad, was he became my buddy when the boys had left the house. And I used to hang out with him a lot. And the most common thing we did was try to play golf. And I say try, because both of us were not very good. And <laughs> dad even still, <laughs> he was not a very good driver. <laughs> he would still in the middle of the fairway, pick up the ball and put it on the tee again. But. <laughs> We just had fun, and the, and the fact that we got to talk to each other when we walked the course. So as you can tell, my dad was a really great man. Mom. Um, in her patriarchal blessing, she had told, was told that she would have many daughters, that she was going to have many daughters. And uh, obviously, she already had Bob and Ron. They didn't do ultrasounds in the 60s, it hadn't been invented yet. And so she didn't know what her last child was gonna be because she had to have a C-section and at that time you only could have, they would only let you have three kids with the C with, if you had had C-sections. But she said that a couple months before I was born, she had heard somebody say, mommy. And so she said she was so blessed to finally get her daughter because she,
didn't know if she was going to be able to have a daughter. Not that I was as prissy as she wanted me to be, but she had her daughter. Because um, as, as you know, Evalu was a petite, beautiful, feminine woman. <laughs> but I said, I've said to her in the last few years that you did have your daughters. You have two wonderful daughter-in-laws, and you have um, many other family members that, that you treated like daughters, the grandchildren. And also the fact that whenever I had friends, she treated them like daughters. And especially these last few years, Kathy and I have been hanging out. She adopted her as, as, a, as a daughter, especially after Kathy lost her, parent, her mom and dad. And so she had plenty of daughters. And I also like to think she also had her dogs as daughters, because that was, that was her dogs. We used to sometimes tease her that she, she would treat the dogs better than, than us. And that's not true, but we would kid her about it. I loved mom's cooking growing up because she loved to make Christmas candy every year. And I would be so excited to go get in her stockings and find homemade Christmas candy. And that was always a treat. Um, and as Bob talked a little bit about her teaching skills, but I wanted to mention one other thing. One year, she had had an operation and wasn't supposed to lift things, and school was starting. So I went with her for two or three weeks to school and helped her every day and got to see, got to see her teach those kids. And she was incredible. She was an incredible teaching, and I really think that was her calling, was a teacher. Mom also loved art, the arts. And as everybody's mentioned, she was a great seamstress. And she used to make clothes, but I wanted to bring one thing up, and you saw the other one. Mom made me all these Barbie clothes one year. And this is the, my only wedding dress. This is my only <laughs> wedding dress I ever had. But you saw that, that um, evening gown sitting on the table. She made that. And I still have all the clothes she made me for Barbies. And yes, I did play with them for a little while. Um, and then she also had made clothing for a little bigger doll. And it's funny because in my room, I usually got the sewing machine in my room. Um, <laughs> And I remember many mornings or days where I had got stuck with pins in my feet because she had dropped a straight pin. But she was an incredible seamstress. And as you heard that she later in life, she did beading and painting and mask making and all sorts of crafts and fun things. Um, but also the other part of the art thing is she taught us to love the arts, all of us. She would take us to plays and musicals and symphonies and museums. And uh, she, I still remember her telling me, for you young kids, you won't know this, but she was able to see Carol Channing in a traveling show of Hello, Dolly! in Texas, which she always said was a great thing. Obviously, you guys probably don't know who Carol Channing is, but the older ones will. And she always used to talk about that. I remember when we went to Las Vegas once and she wanted to see Debbie Reynolds. Probably don't know who she is. So I didn't get to go to my Osmonds because she was insistent that we went to see Debbie Reynolds' show. But she was so great about all the arts and, and teaching us that. Um, let's see. A couple other things really quick. My mom was courageous independent and devoted. Her parents were not active in the church. And so she would at first go with her grandmother and her aunt, but she would go by herself. She was determined she was going to go to church. And then when Susan came along, who's about nine years younger than her, she took Susan to church so that she was able to do that. Um, and was very devoted. In fact, when her and dad started dating, if you know anything about Lewiston, it's a small little town. When they started dating, she said, do you smoke, was the first thing she asked him. 
And he said, well, I'm a member of the church. And she said, but do you smoke? Because in Lewison, there was a lot of what they used to call Jack Mormons, I'm not sure what you call them now, that didn't follow the word of wisdom. And so she was determined she was not, because her parents smoked, and she was determined she was not going to marry a smoker. Um, <laughs> the other thing that, that always used to make me sad was after she married dad, and don't get me wrong, her parents loved dad. But when they came back from their honeymoon, her parents had thrown all her possessions on the front porch and did not let her go into the house to get them. And I just thought, what a sad way to start out a, a new marriage. But in the end, they absolutely adored Gordon. They absolutely adored him. And then she was even in her own way non-racist because we lived in, I think it was Alabama at the time in the 60s. And she had a maid would come in and help out. And she said, well, stay, sit down, let's have some lunch together. And so she sat down. Well, people passed by and saw her sitting um, with the maid. And she had lots of people tell her you couldn't do that. And she said, I can do whatever I want. <laughs> so she, she had that courage to do that in that time frame. And obviously, I can't say something about her without talking about the shopping. And I know everybody has their different shopping stories with mom. But um, she taught me how to shop and how to find a bargain. I might not be the, the most feminine chic person, but Kathy still laughs at me today if I cannot find socks that match my outfit. <laughs> and. Uh, but it's because mom taught me how to do that and, uh, and never paying full price. <laughs> and we used to give her a bad time and we used to call it shopping math because she'd come home and say, I got something, it was 50% off, so I saved this much money. <laughs> and you couldn't explain to her, well, if you hadn't bought it at all, <laughs> you wouldn't have had to pay it. But we used to call that shopping math. And the other thing I wanted to talk about mom was her sense of humor, her fun, and even her sarcasm. Bob mentioned a water fight, but we also had, I had a water fight too. We were running around our house and all my friends were over there and we were doing an outside water fight. And she said, well, I want to come. And so she opened the door and came out and started doing a water fight with us. And even all my friends said later, <laughs> I can't believe that your mom came out and had a water fight with us. Um, I remember one time, you know, after you get over those rebellious or sarcastic teenage years, I remember one time having her go to me with, to a wedding shower for one of my missionary companions where they invited all the mothers to come. And I just sat there and went, wow, mom was the life of the party. I didn't realize how much she um, could talk and interact with people and how good she really was at that and how she had them all laughing too and I I used to think I got my sense of humor from my dad but I really think it was mom I mean it was a little bit of dad but I really think it was mom um, one of the other funny stories was they were going to Disneyland with us and we get to the airport and we say well, where's your driver's license, Mom? And she goes, well, I'm not going to drive. Why do I need a driver's license? You know, this was about 2010. And, uh, and I said, well, they're not going to let you on the plane. And she goes, well, it's all the way back in Logan. I, get, I, can't, get, I can't do anything about it. So we went out there, and we thought maybe, you know, it's Salt Lake. Maybe with all of us together, we all have the same ticket. They might let her go on the flight. So we get to security and mom's pulling her wallet out. I got this credit card, I got this credit card with my name on it. Oh, here's my temple recommend and all this stuff. And they actually let her get on the flight. I was a little worried because I thought, I don't think they're gonna do that in California. And so luckily JT, was staying at one of the ha our house, I think, as she he was watching the dogs, drove all the way up to Logan and got her driver's license. And then 
FedEx it to us. But the funny thing was, nobody had asked her for ID the entire time. We get the license, and the next day we went to Chico's, and when she went to pay, they asked for her driver's license for identification. So it was lucky like that. Okay, two things I have to tell. <laughs> Because this is something Kathy and I would, that really tells how funny mom was. We were supposed to go down to Tuacon to see Joseph and the amazing Technicolor coat. And so we were going to go, and we were sitting there, and the, it was one of those times when the generator blew up, and they finally came and said, you can't go. It's not, we can't do the production tonight. So we sat home, and we were talking to mom. And in her bedroom, <laughs> I don't know, she, this is just something crazy. She goes, well, I'm sorry you missed the show. And she says, but let me give it for you. <laughs> and she started singing the songs to Joseph and and dancing. And Kathy and I, I thought we were going to die laughing because it was so funny. But if you know my, knew my mom well enough to know, she was not a good singer. <laughs> You know, and here's Kathy, who had been, or you, I think you were still in the tab at that time, Tabernacle Choir. And here's Kathy, but Kathy just went along with the whole thing, and we were just laughing so hard, it was pretty funny. And we used to tease her about that quite a bit. And then the other thing that happened in the last few years, <laughs> we had just gone to see To Kill a Mockingbird play, and we were in the, Kathy and I were in the front seat, and Mom was in the back, and we just kept talking about it and how good the to kill a mockingbird was. To, and mom leans up and said, what is a tequila mockingbird? <laughs> and, and we're like, no, we're talking about to kill a mockingbird. But that was a big joke between the three of us all the time. We would say, hey, you, you want to go get a tequila mockingbird? <laughs> and the funny thing in Houston airport, when we went to see JT and Andrew last year, they actually have the Mockingbird Distillery, I think it is, or something, and we were just laughing about it. Anyway, um, I wish, I, I don't think it would work. About three, three or four months ago, when she was starting to get really bad, I asked her to, to uh, if she remembered any of her old readings. And so I have, and I haven't even shared this with Ron and Bob, but I have a, a little, you know, few second clip of where she does a reading. And after all these years, she still could remember two different readings. And I will treasure that forever because that was something she enjoyed doing. We know the last few years were tough for mom and dad. To lose your independence and dignity is rough. And I think that is why. Um, and for those two who were very independent their whole lives, it, it was tough these last few years. But I have, I have felt such a peace, until we close the casket, but I have felt such a peace with their passing and that they were able to, to go so close to each other and that they now are able to run and dance and think, and think again and be happy with each other. It, it gives me much peace. And I know I see some staff from Legacy, and I just wanted to thank them so much for these last few weeks. So many of them stopped by just to check in on Mom and Dad. They really loved her at that place. And um, even though they weren't responsible, some of them weren't even responsible for that day, that after Dad passed, they even shared with us that they had felt Dad's presence watching over mom there. And they would just come in and hold her hand the last week. And so I just wanted to thank them for that and their caring of them. I know that we were so lucky to have them as parents and that they are happy again and that um, we will be reunited with them once again as, as a family together. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
Um, I'm not one for speaking, but I was actually really grateful to be able to share some memories of Grandma and Grandpa today. Um, so as most of you know, Grandpa was born on December 10th and his first grandchild, me, ended up being born on December 10th too. And it was a special bond we always had and it, it was nice. Um, the day he turned 93, we called, happy birthday, Grandpa, happy birthday, Trina. And I had turned 39. So I was 39, he was 93 on the exact same day. <laughs> I like to tell people that story. I like numbers and things like that. Um, Grandpa liked music. And I think it was last year we did a nativity for him and grandma. And it was really awesome. We had singing and words. And as we were singing Silent Night, we heard grandpa just singing along with us. Um, so that was a really special memory. <laughs> Um, also, when Grandma and Grandpa lived in St. George, we went to visit them for the holidays, and Grandma, she loved to do things to just make us happy, um, and so they wanted to take us to the new Muppet movie, and now every time, every time I see the Muppets in any aspect, movies or whatever, I think of Grandma and Grandpa and that special fun memory with them. Um, Grandpa enjoyed food. He was not a big guy, but he would sample everything. And so we would go to Costco sometimes um, and just walk around the store and sample the food. So that was a, a fun time we had with them. And then lastly, I think I'm supposed to do two minutes, but I'm trying to go fast. Um, grandma, as we all know, loved to shop and she was very, very good at shopping. So when I was a senior, she took me out and we got a special dress. It took like two hours, but <laughs> it was always a fun time to do things like that. Okay, last, this will be my last story. <laughs> Um, so Clarissa got her endowments this week <laughs> and it was the day after grandma passed and it was crazy because I could feel her and I could feel grandpa in the temple with us and it was so special that, <laughs> sorry, when, when they were in their physical bodies here at the end, they couldn't have come but they were able to come and it was just in time. Okay, one last thing. <laughs> but the day before that, I took Clarissa shopping and we were picking out a temple bag and there was a scripture bag to match and I could hear grandma telling me, you need to buy that. <laughs> but we love grandma and grandpa so much and grateful again that I could share some memories. I was teasing my dad because I'm the only one who got a phone call of what not to talk about. <laughs> no, I... Uh, as I was thinking back on my memories with grandma and grandpa, I realized that I don't have any memories where they're not together. And that was just so amazing to see someone you know your entire life, and they've been there the whole time, and they're always just this shining example. Um, Especially, I think, I don't know, I think I must have gotten in trouble more than even their kids whenever we would visit. Like I would, I would get so excited because their house was so interesting and they would keep so many like trinkets and things from their trips like hidden away in these cupboards and closets and I would always explore. And I remember one time grandma getting so mad at me because they got into something and, and then 
I was downstairs and I could hear him talking, so I, I was supposed to be in timeout, but I snuck up the stairs. <laughs> and I remember her like laughing about it as she would like tell grandpa what I was doing. I'm like, oh, she was pretending to be mad so I could be in trouble. And I just, it was just so funny that even when I like was in trouble with them, I could feel the love, you know? Uh, and the same with, so with grandpa, like he was always, so kind. I remember the, the one time, I don't know why I have these memories of getting in trouble, but the one time I got in trouble from him is because I snuck into something and broke something of grandma's. And, and he got mad at me and I was like, I am in trouble. This is like the one time. And so I, he has me come stand in the kitchen and he starts making the sandwich. And it was around Thanksgiving. It was like leftover turkey. And I'm like, what is he doing? Make, and he's like, no, you just stand there. And I think my parents were gone. I don't know where they were. And I was like watching him, he puts butter on the toast, and, I, and then he put mayonnaise on that, and then he put the turkey on. I'm like, that's gross. And he's like, you're going to eat it, you're going to sit at the table, and you're going to eat this, you're going to like it, and then you're going to think about what you did. And I did. And, and then a minute later, he sat down next to me at the table, and it was as if I didn't do anything wrong. He had already forgotten, and he was already back to just being this loving grandpa. He was already there to talk and just chat about this great holiday. And we would talk about little uh, projects he was working on. I was always looked so forward to popular mechanics. And I remember one time I snuck into his office. And I was thinking around with something. And he came in and caught me. And he's like, oh, I was fixing that. And so he sat down and started fixing it with me showing me how to like solder and all these little things. And I thought that was the coolest thing. I was like, no other grandpa can do this. And it's like, I, as I grew up, I thought my dad could do everything. But then I realized as I got older, there were things that when my dad was like, I don't know what to do, he would call grandpa and grandpa would figure it out, like with the car or something or like little. And I was like, wow, grandpa knows more than dad even? This is why. <laughs> Anyways, and then my grandma, this is, She's the best. She would always have a joke and a laugh. And uh, even if no one else got my dumb joke, Grandma would be laughing like, oh, that was good. Or, um, and we were blessed to be, live so close to her uh, the last few years. Uh, it was hard to see them go downhill, but it was amazing to see them even as they were losing their ability to kind of control their bodies and everything. They would like forget things so much. It was amazing to see that this love shine through no matter what. They always loved each other. Um, and I remember she invited all the grandkids over, whatever. They all got to pick out dresses or whatnots. I don't know. She had so many different styles of things, but I remember a few weeks later, Tiasha was getting ready, and I come out, and I was like, wow, that looks really cute. Wow, that's nice. And she's like, oh, it was your grandma's. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, it was just so funny to have this grandma who was just like, was so, like, she knew what was going on. She like, I don't know, it was just funny. One last thing, I guess. Two last things, I guess. Uh, so I hope, like, a week before, <laughs> A week before they passed, it was, uh, so we were in their stake, and so uh, we went over to bring them the sacrament. And at this time, Grandpa just wasn't really there 90% of the time. Uh, but every once in a while, he'd be there, and he would like talk to you and try to talk, and then it would just like, he'd, he'd slip away again. But I remember the guy that was with us was like, turned to him and Grandma, was like, we brought you the sacrament, would you like to take it? And Grandpa looks at me, with his face that he'll do sometimes like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, duh, like, of course I will. Like, he'll, and it was just like, that was who he was, is even though he's losing his mind, he's just like, this is, of course I want to do this thing. I want, like, he was always just this, like, faithful example. And uh, I was going to tell the story about the ping pong, too. I'm supposed to keep it, I, I would put it to two minutes. I had a timer, but my phone's off. I don't know. But so I was a teenager and I'd been playing with my friends, beating my friends and dad's like, grandpa's going to beat you. And I'm like, okay. And he's coming down like how he walked all like, and to a teenager, he was like a hundred at that time, even though he was in his sixties or 70 or something. And so he was walking like he could barely move. And I'm like, oh man, this is going to be easy. 
but yeah, he'd be like, he got all serious and be like, point, and I'm like, what is happening? Like the first point, point, and it would just be like, I got slaughtered. It was so embarrassing. And I, I and he's like, yeah, we used to have better rackets. I put sandpaper on mine and I could spin it. And I'm like, and he's spinning it. I couldn't even see it a few times. Like, I didn't know he could move like that. Anyways, it it was just so fun to have them as grandparents and such great examples. And I I uh, I don't know. We love them, and we're so grateful they're part of our life. So Grandma wanted to keep this funeral to under an hour, but she's going to just have to be okay with this. Um, so Grandpa was a great singer, um, and I think he was, he was humble. Um, Grandma was telling me a story about him and her, and he, he, was, he was very smart, and she knew he could do the job at Boeing. And she told me that she had to go and she filled out the application for him. And she did a resume and she sent it in. And he got a call and she was like, you can do this. <laughs> um, and so he was, I feel like he was just humble. He, he didn't think of him as himself as like brilliant, like I think he was. Um, so grandma, here are some things that make me think of her. These are some words that come to my mind often. Oh, that's darling. Is that what you're wearing? <laughs> How's school? When are you going back to school? Do your kids do well in school? <laughs> That was, she actually asked me last week, or I don't know, last week. It would have been last week. She asked how my kids were doing in school. Um, and one of my favorite memories is we were down there for our Thanksgiving Christmas, and we'll open our Christmas gifts, and Grandma pulls out this box, and she's like, from Gord or to, to Lou, love Gordon. She's like, I wonder what it is. And she opens it up and she goes, oh, how did you know? This is just what I wanted. And Grandpa goes, Grandpa's like, what I get you, Lou? <laughs> um, and then, let's see. She, I think they purchased the Pepperidge Farm cookies and goldfish just for us, like David said, because every time we visited, they sent us home with a bag of goldfish and Pepperidge Farm cookies. <laughs> um, let's see. She loved a clean house. I even remember I showed up, I surprised them. And I showed up to their house, and she's sitting there, and Grandpa had moved the furniture, and she was, she was vacuuming. And they're like, oh, hi. <laughs> and she's like, I gotta go get ready first. <laughs> um, I think she loved that Trina loved to shop, because I definitely did not. Um, Grandpa, I always remember him doing things. He was always doing things, wearing those, br those blue coveralls. He just always had those on. Um, he built our, he built us a little dollhouse when we were little and it wasn't, it was beautiful. There was like, they built little, um, he built little beds and chairs and there was wallpaper and there were curtains on this dollhouse. It was, it was so great. Um, let me think of what else I wanted to say really quick. Um, we took him last year or the year before to see our house and we decorated it for Christmas and he said, I've never seen anything so great. This was definitely worth the drive. That's what Grandpa said. Um, and then I was taking them to church one day when they moved into the care center and it's just down the, down the stairs. and. 
grandma's like, Gordon, we're going to church. And he's like, oh, okay. And so he hurries into the, the back room and he changes. He's like, I don't know what I'm going to wear because they didn't have their church clothes there. <laughs> so I found him a sweater and he put it on. And then he comes back out and then he goes into the bathroom and he shaves his face and he comes back out. And he's like, does this look okay? And grandma's like, yeah, you look fine, Gordon. And then, and then <laughs> he's like, I think I need to go take a shower. And I'm like, you can't, we gotta go. <laughs> and um, grandma, I got this cute little um, shirt for her to wear. And I was like, I brought this. It's from the bag of clothes that you gave us. This and this. And she goes, is it from Chico's? And then she felt it, and she's like, oh. <laughs> and I'm like, sorry, Grandma, you're going to just have to wear this. <laughs> um, but let me make sure that was the only thing. Um, oh, and then Grandma, she loved those dogs, yes. She would heat up turkey for them all the, all the time. And I would always be excited to get to go on the walks that Grandpa would do with the dogs. Um, Anyway, we're going to miss them. They loved each other so much. And I, I'll miss them, but I know that they're happy, and I'm so glad they get to be together. Oh, I can't, tell, not, I can't not tell this story. I'm sorry. So we were playing Shanghai, and Grandma and Grandpa, this is a card game that we all played, and we loved it. And Grandma would get up from the table. She would get us cookies. She would get, you know get drinks, whatever, and um, <laughs> and it'd go around the table and it'd be her turn again. <laughs> and Grandpa's like, Lou, it's your turn. And I think he was getting a little frustrated that she kept standing up. And um, <laughs> she came and she sat down and she's like, what round are we on again? And I think we were collecting um, two runs or three runs or something, and she was collecting the opposite. She was collecting sets. And she goes, oh no. And she's like, just a minute. And she just started moving her cards around. And then she went completely out and stuck us all with her hands. <laughs> anyway, it was so great. She was always so lucky <laughs> with playing cards and things. So. Millie's going to join. Um, I decided, I had a couple thoughts, but I'm just going to share one story. And Shelly left it off the story, so I'm not sure if she wanted me to tell it. But uh, if we revisit the time that Grandma forgot our license, uh, we were driving to the airport. I was driving Shelly, Kathy, Grandma, and Grandpa. And we realized Grandma didn't have her license, and it was kind of tense and a little bit of a panic. And Grandpa said, it's fine. I'll just tell him Lou's not a terrorist. They'll let her on. <laughs> And I think that's a characteristic of the wisers, right? We are quick to laugh, um, we're quick to smile, and I think that comes from grandma and grandpa. We're gonna miss them a lot. Thank you. Really wanted to join me too. Um, I just wanted to, yeah, share maybe two quick thoughts. One is, is our family always loved this story, but we talked about how much grandma loved her dogs and she would always talk to them like they were humans and they could understand what she was saying. One time when the Wiser clan came and visited them, you know, ZZ hadn't ever, her dog hadn't really ever seen us, so she, the dog was freaking out as we were all walking in and grandma said, ZZ, I told you there'd be new people here today. Why are you acting like this? <laughs> So we always got a kick out of that. And yeah, we just, you know, we just loved them so much. And they, everyone's talked about what great um, examples they were of a loving marriage. And, you know, they, they really avoided contention. I don't think I ever heard them disagree about anything apart from whether or not they had eaten at like a Jason's Deli at a specific location. <laughs> that was the extent of things they would fight about. And uh, 
they just always spoke. They were so sweet to each other. And, you know, after we moved to Texas, I would try to call grandma on Mother's Day. And I remember one Mother's Day I was talking to her. This was probably when grandpa was 92 or 93. And, you know, I asked her, oh, how's grandpa doing? And she said, well, you know, we went to the doctor and he said he's doing OK. And I said, well, that's pretty good for someone who's almost 100. And grandma was so mad that I said that, oh, he is not almost 100. He's, he's not even close to that. And, you know, I was like, he's 92% of the way there. But she didn't want anything to ever sound like anyone was ever talking bad of him. So they were just such a great example. And we loved them so much. And we'll miss them for sure. We'll sing one verse of Abide With Me to Stay Evening Tide, M 165. Our dear kind Father in heaven, we come before thee at the close of this beautiful funeral services for grandma and grandpa, mother and father, friend, sister, and we thank thee for the lives that they lived for their example. We thank thee for the love of our family and those that are so kind and good to us. We thank thee for our Savior. For what he has done to make make our lives possible to be able to live together forever. We're grateful that we can repent and become better every day. We're thankful for these examples and pray that thou will help us that we will remember them. As we strive to do those things that are good and to follow their examples. Please be with us as we drive and fly to our places this day and this week. Help us to be safe 
and to be able to remember our fond and good memories. We love thee so very much. And we say these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.